I'm thrilled to be joined by Alex Epstein of the Center for Industrial Progress to talk about fossil fuels, energy, clean energy, and its viability, and what is on his mind. He runs a great organization that I just mentioned. Obviously, he has several books. He has one coming out next spring, and he has really been on top of kind of counteracting some of the radical push for going carbon-free by arbitrary deadlines and talks about energies like nuclear and others that are truly clean and has a lot to say about the subject. So Alex, thank you so much for joining the podcast and also the simultaneous YouTube broadcast as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. How did you get interested in the energy issue? What's what sprung it about? And it's it's a long story and I never even usually tell the beginning of it. I mean, because the real beginning of it was way before I was interested in energy. When I was 18, I learned something about the modern environmental movement that really changed my perspective, which is that the, I realized the core of what people call being green or being, quote, an environmentalist in its modern meaning is eliminating human impact on nature. So that was one point. And then the other point was that human beings survive and flourish by impacting nature productively. Like that's actually how we live on an otherwise very unlivable planet for the average person. And so it made me realize that the core idea animating modern environmental thinking was an anti-human idea. And that really offended me as a human in general who likes humans, uh, but also as a big fan of productive achievement. Really, I always admired business people, and you know, athletes, other kinds of heroes, but particularly those who produce a lot of value. And this is really a movement that at its core is against human beings producing value and making the world a more livable place for humans. So I usually tell the later part of the story, which is nine years later, I had no knowledge of energy still. I just had this knowledge that the environmental movement was anti-human because it's anti-impact, but I didn't really understand energy. And I was certainly concerned about uh, climate uh, issues and afraid, even afraid of that to a significant extent. Um, and then I started learning that energy is the industry that powers every other industry. So it's really the core of how we make the world a livable place for human beings. It's the core of our productive um, ability, that's one. And then two is that fossil fuels are uniquely good at producing energy cost effectively, by which I mean doing it at low cost, high reliability, every type of machine and in civilization, including mobile machines like airplanes and tractors and cargo ships that are really hard to do with anything besides oil. And then also to could do it on a scale of billions of people. So I hadn't realized A, the importance of energy to human flourishing, and then B, fossil fuels unique role but once I got that, it really became apparent to me that we have this bizarre fixation only on negative side effects of fossil fuels, but ignoring the fundamental benefits. And you take something like agriculture, where we, re we rely on fertilizer derived from natural gas, and we tractors and all this agricultural equipment powered by oil. And yet we talk about, oh, what's going to happen if it gets warmer? How's that going to affect food production? But we don't talk about what about getting off fossil fuels? And I made a comment in a debate once, fossil fuels are the food of food. You're talking about eliminating that and nobody cares. So I, real, my, my way of thinking is always philosophical. And this is a very clear cut example of only looking at the negative side effects of something and not looking at the benefits. So at that point, I really became interested in energy and really became interested in, if you look at the full context, not just negative side effects, but also benefits, how do fossil fuels stack up? And that's really what led me to become an extreme enthusiast for fossil fuels. It certainly has. And your interest in the area inspired your organization, the Center for Industrial Progress. What are your primary goals with the organization, expanding on what you just laid out? This is, so the original mission of the Center for Industrial Progress, and I might have named it differently now than I did when it came out, because it was, it was a broader mission, which really relates to this, my opposition to eliminating human impact. So the, the idea was, I want a movement that doesn't have this, that really values our environment, values a livable world, but rejects this anti-human idea of eliminating our impact on nature and instead looks at everything from a human flourishing perspective. So how do we make the world a better place for human flourishing? And I, since you talk a lot about preservation and conservation, I'll relate it to that. So the view is neither that, like I don't view human things as unnatural or like, inherently, certainly inherently bad. I just view them as they're a potential thing that can benefit us. So like there are reasons why with a particularly beautiful spot, you don't want to put a water slide there, you know, or a parking lot like that. But, but it's because that 
preserving it advances human flourishing. There are other places where you definitely want a road and you need a road anyway to get to that beautiful spot. So I think a lot of our conversation about environment has a very strong bias against human made things. And my view is I look at human made and non human made things from a human flourishing perspective with the goal of we want the best overall world for us. And one way of thinking of it is having, we want the, the most pro-human relationship with the rest of nature. So it's not that we're against it or we're for it. It's like saying, well, am I against my dog? No, I want a relationship with my dog that's ultimately really good for me. And of course, that's a lot better for him than him being in the woods, right? So it, it's, I think just having a pro-human perspective on environment and industrial issues, that was really the core. Um, but I ended up focusing more on energy than I expected to. So in a sense, it's the Center for Energy Progress, just because that was my focus at the beginning, but it, it turns out to have an unlimited amount to talk about and a lot of things that need to change. So I used to think, oh, I'm going to go on to talk about plastics and GMOs and all of these other things. And I can talk about them tangentially, but energy is occupying me full time. Right. And that's why you have a really helpful guide in energy talking points and throughout the years, because I've, I've been familiar with your work for quite a while, a lot of people look to you for guidance about how to refute arguments about pushing for solar and wind and away from kind of this all above all of the above energy approach, which is primarily uh, based on hydrocarbons like fossil fuels. And what do you say to individuals? We see a lot of politicians, media figures, and even some people on the center right who say you have to decarbonize by 2040, 2050, I think some on the right will say, well, we can push it back a little bit. We don't want full decarbonization quite yet, but even some I would say on our side are starting to buy into that argument, but what is the fault with pushing that type of uh, idea and, and what consequences will that bear, you think, to so, so the United States? I wanna comment on two things you said. So first of all, th thanks, I'm glad you like Energy Talking Points and people can check that out at energytalkingpoints.com. And one, one reason I created that was because I thought I had done a good job at giving people a good high level and even in-depth perspective on the issue of fossil fuels as such in the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And then I would give speeches, but I found that in practice, you know, people have to deal with all these concrete policy issues where the morality of fossil fuels comes up, where other kinds of environmental issues come up. And so I would, I would be able to do it myself, but then other people would have trouble doing it. And so I thought, okay, I wanna create something where people can just have this unlimited stockpile of ammunition. So they not only know my broader perspective, but if fracking comes up, they can deal with it. Or if a reconciliation bill comes up, they can deal with it. Or if infrastructure comes up, they can deal with it. So that website, energytalkingpoints.com, like I highly suggest people go to it and just search for any term. And I think you'll see, oh, wow, there's some really interesting points and, and references. So in terms of like decarbonization, I mean, so it's weird because that's the way everyone thinks of it. That's kind of people's baseline right now. Like, oh yeah, we should do that. Or, or should we do it? Or how quickly should we do it? And I don't even, to me, it's, it's an insane crackpot idea. And so this, this goes to what's your baseline. My baseline is what's going to advance human flourishing around the world, what energy policy, which includes environmental and climate aspects, is going to advance human flourishing around the world. And I think the, the facts, some of which I've mentioned are one is energy, low cost reliable energy is essential to human flourishing. So without low cost reliable energy, we cannot use machines to be extremely productive and prosperous. And so we're poor and endangered. So that's fact one. Fact two is fossil fuels are a unique source of low cost reliable energy. They provide 80% of the world's energy they're particularly good for heavy duty uh, mobility and they're very good for what's called industrial heat. So a lot of industry like making plastics and uh, different kinds of metals and stuff involves fossil fuels very heavily and in hard to replace ways. So their, their energy is incredibly valuable, fossil fuels are unique. And then the world is incredibly deprived of energy in the sense that billions of people lack low cost reliable energy. One statistic I like that I got from Robert Bryce is that you know, 3 billion people use less electricity than a typical American refrigerator. So it's like the world is still so short of energy. So the idea that we're talking about, let's eliminate our unique leading source of energy, that should be viewed as an incredibly scary idea. It should not be aspirate. I mean, should at least be there are huge hazards. And I think the fact that there's almost no concern with the hazards of that and no concern certainly to the scale that is warranted shows there's something very off with the way people are thinking about it. And I think it goes back to what I said, 
I disagree with about the environmental movement. Its whole focus is eliminating our impact on climate. What does decarbonization mean? It just means eliminating our emissions of CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, that could be a goal, but to make it the goal at which everything else is sacrificed to, there's no human basis for that, particularly if you start looking at it at all. There's no, I mean, there's no plausibility. Oh, this is such an apocalypse. Like you can say it'll be overall bad maybe, but that's questionable, but like it's an apocalypse. Is that an apocalypse, the level of depriving billions of people of the energy they need to live? Even you look at like Europe right now, what's their biggest climate problem? Even a civilized place, it's potentially freezing to death and having their industry shut down because their idiotic policies on natural gas and coal, and they're not anywhere near decarbonized. So my view is the world should be using far more energy. Fossil fuels are crucial. Uh, we should develop low carbon, no carbon alternatives. And that's primarily achieved through freedom. Um, we can talk about the climate issue, but I think even if you haven't heard my explanation or don't agree yet on the climate issue, it should strike you as hugely problematic that energy is so crucial and fossil fuels are so good at providing it and it's so needed. And yet everyone is talking casually about eliminating it. And to me, that's a philosophical thing. Our focus is let's eliminate our impact on climate versus let's advance human flourishing. I think it's ultimately like a primitive religion, which is just the view that, oh, it's wrong for us to impact nature. And so we're all like, it has the trappings of like, we're so guilty about it. And, you know, we're apologizing for it. And it, it, I don't think it at all maps to an actual magnitude of threat to human life. I think it really is this primitive religious guilt that it's wrong for us to impact things. And, and I just reject that. That would mean giving up our really high standard of living if we were yeah. to decarbonize, which I would think is a rash decision. I think if you confront these individuals individually on a, on a personal basis, I think they wouldn't sacrifice. We see a lot of hypocrisy, obviously, with the different climate uh, policymakers in the Biden administration all throughout, I would say, different administrations, especially those who kind of lean more on the preservationist far left side. They don't follow their rules. They don't want wind turbines overlooking their backyard if they have coastal property. They don't heed the alarm of rising coastal uh, erosion. They buy oceanfront properties in Florida many a time. So it, it seems like it, there's a disconnect between the policies they are advocating and them actually. So why, why, do you think that, why do you think that is? I'm curious what people's views on that are. I have my own guess, but. I'm not sure. I think it's virtue signaling for one. And then two, they they don't fully believe what they're articulating, I guess, partly. Maybe they, they want to get brownie points for checking off the box of saying this, but they don't follow through because it's impossible to follow through. Yeah, I, I think there is a really interesting element of people not believing in climate catastrophe. And it's very justified to not believe it because one, one fact I, I point out a lot is that our actual danger level from climate is far lower than it's ever been. So that the chance of you dying from a climate-related disaster is 1 50th what it would have been 100 years ago. So think about that, we're 50 times safer from climate in terms of mortality, and yet we view it as an emergency. So I, and, and why is it? Well, the, the way I like to explain it is, fossil fuels didn't take a safe climate and make it dangerous, they took a dangerous climate and made it far safer. So you think of things like sturdy buildings and heating and air conditioning, and the ability to move, you know, uh, alleviate drought with vehicles and to alleviate drought with irrigation, like all of these things are powered by fossil fuel machines. And so they took the naturally dangerous climate and made it far safer. And yeah, it's warmed one degree Celsius in 170 years. And you could argue about how good or bad that is, but that's trivial in comparison to our ability to master uh, the climate. And so in practice, people have this weird disconnect because they talk about, oh, we've destroyed climate, it's worse than ever. But part of them knows that's not true. And so they part, some people hold it as, oh yeah, in the future, it's gonna be terrible. But it's, it's this weird thing where people like to say that it's a catastrophe and they're like some Marvel superhero rescuing the world, but it's not the actual fear that the people in the Marvel movies um, have. And I think that's a very dangerous situation when people are getting a lot of status out of claiming that there's a catastrophe and they're advocating like radical policies for others, but there's not actually the threat that makes them adjust their own behavior. And even I saw one study that I'll probably tweet about soon, which is even among the people who are writing the reports for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I have a lot of issues with as an organization, 
Uh, but even like the people who believe, who say it's catastrophic, like a very small percentage of them say they have even adopted low carbon lifestyles. So even these people, like I would say the most biased scientists who have the most extreme negative projections, like even they aren't doing things. So it's, it's this very weird thing. It's very different, say, from being in, um, like when you're attacked in a war and it's actual threat. I think, don't you have a, didn't you grow up in a communist country or didn't you? No, my parents. Oh, your parents. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you imagine like what that is like as a real threat where you're like, I'm going to take an extreme action because this is like totally ruining or threatening my life. Like those are real things. People don't act anywhere near that way with regard to climate, but they make very aggressive proposals for others' behavior. And for various reasons, those tend to affect the poorest people the most because what they tend to be most successful at is stopping new development, not regressing existing development. So yeah, we are harmed in the United States by these policies. And if we do build back better, AKA make everything worse, it'll be really bad. And you can regress like Venezuela uh, has, but like really a lot of what we're doing is stopping the development of fossil fuels in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and preventing them from having the massive gains that say China and India have. Yeah, and I believe that terminology or that action to do that in Africa is called neocolonialism. And I've seen this in wildlife yeah. conservation efforts. So they're trying mm. to impose their will on these countries. And I saw in the Atlantic, I think uh, the one gentleman behind Inovix Inc., who shined a light on North Face's kind of hypocrisy right. when it comes to hydrocarbons and uh, the materials that they use in their products. He had posted this article in the Atlantic talking about the different African leaders who said, we actually need and we want to develop fossil fuels to move away from technologies we were using that were far more harmful than what we are doing now with natural gas and oil. And they're not wanting the different actors in the United States to come in and tell their countries what to do. And I think there's an issue with banking too, where some people, I guess some virtue signalers are encouraging banks to not lend and credit companies that do business with Africa, which could have a lot of implications of doing that even here in the United States. With if it's Antarctica fossil fuels, budget. they won't do business. Yeah. So yeah, they, trying to if stop they just said we won't do business with Africa, then it, they would get tagged as racist. Oh, absolutely. We don't know fossil fuels in Africa. Then you're you're great because you're protecting the poor Africans from the evil of fossil fuels. That, of course, is the good that makes your life possible. So yes, it's really perverse. And one nice thing I'm seeing is that I think my work, as well as others, has started to publicize this. And I think it's an area of very great discomfort for the modern environmental movement because they are very legitimately afraid of being seen as, oh, we are we are acting to harm the progress uh, of, you know, a bunch of quote unquote people of color. And that's viewed as like, okay, if particularly in their circles, that's like, what could be the worst thing? But it is really important that it, I mean, it is like, I don't think skin color is important, but you're taking a bunch of innocent people and you are ruining their prospects to improve their lives. Mm -hmm. And that should be, uh, while, while using the things that you're trying to stop them from using to improve your own life. You alluded to clean energy technology that can be viable without upending our standard of living, upending the free market system. What in your eyes is that viable alternative? Nuclear, geothermal, well, the, any of those the, technologies? The real answer to that would be have a free market and find out. I think there's a, you know, part of believing in freedom is, is having the knowledge that you don't know specifically what will work. And, and I end up talking about the non-viability of certain things like solar and wind, at least as they're proposed, because these are part of coercive government schemes. It's not that I like go out of my way to just trash solar and wind, but people are claiming solar and wind can replace fossil fuels and therefore it's okay to ban fossil fuels. And, that, and then I have to show you, you know, that is totally baseless. So I think if you, if you look at what's most, what would it, and with nuclear, there's a huge problem because it's basically criminalized. So I think the main thing is to liberate it so that people can experiment on a free market with it. Um, you know, in general, if you look at what, what technologies have succeeded in energy, fossil fuels, obviously number one, but you know, number two and three would be hydro and nuclear. And they all have three things in common that are uh, hydro partially. Uh, and geothermal sort of has this where they are naturally stored, naturally concentrated, naturally abundant. So naturally stored, like fossil fuel has energy stored in it, in a sense a river does, particularly if you dam it, 
nuclear material has a huge amount of energy stored. This relates to concentration as well. And so what you find is when you have energy that's stored, you can release it on demand and it's very easy to have controllable energy, which is very important above all for electricity where you need to control it very precisely. Whereas you take something like solar and wind, it's an intermittent flow. And so then that you have this problem of, you have to deal with this uncontrollable source. So how do you turn something uncontrollable into something controllable? So there's storage, there's concentration, which the more you have, all things being equal, the cheaper it is to do things, but also the more mobile it is. And then abundant, if it's not abundant, you, you can't use it for very long in very large quantities. And so oil, coal, and gas have these, qua these qualities to various degrees. Nuclear does, hydro does in many ways. And so what you expect is the energies of the future will have those qualities and solar and wind don't. So you could imagine them getting over those its problems, but it's come nowhere close. Geothermal is interesting because it's very limited in the way that you can, like in the modern version, it's used hugely in Iceland because Iceland has unique geological features, namely a lot of heat near the surface that allows you to do that, whereas that doesn't exist. Most places there's something called deep geothermal that seems to have potential, but it's like, it's still in prototype phase. So the thing is that fossil fuels are by far the world's best source of energy. There's a strong case that nuclear could be a much more significant player had it not been criminalized by the green movement for 40 years. Uh, but the scale of what fossil fuels can do, like nothing is remotely close to it right now. And so, and the world needs far more energy. And this is why, you know, my next book is Fossil Future. I have the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. I just don't think people have any idea of how valuable what fossil fuels do is, how much it's needed, and how uniquely good fossil fuels will be at that for most people for the foreseeable future. And speaking of your book, could you give us a little synopsis, uh, my listeners and viewers, on what they can expect from your book when it's coming out, details relating to it? Yeah, sure. So the, the basic, um, so there's the moral case for fossil fuels, which is out, and then fossil future. And they have, they have similar themes. Fossil future is much more in depth, and it's more, as the title suggests, it's more focused on the future. So it's really focused on what is the right path for the next several generation in light of you know, different concerns, particularly uh, climate related. And so my view, you know, the subtitle is why global human flourishing requires more oil, coal, and natural gas, not less. And so that's the basic idea is that for the next two generations, at least, we should be using more of these. And then I think what the book is, is it's a very systematic analysis of our energy options going forward. And, and I think one, one attribute of it that might be distinctive to people is it has a lot of material on how to think about issues. I think often people just jump into something like energy or climate. And they're just like, here's my opinion. Here's some facts. And as someone whose background is philosophy, I think a lot about what's the method or framework that I'm coming to things at. And my basic argument in the book is most of the disagreement in um, over energy and climate issues is not disagreement about scientific facts or economic facts. It's mostly a disagreement about methodology and in particular values. So is your top value advancing human flourishing or is it eliminating impact on nature? And I think I show very definitively that most of the anti-fossil fuel movement and most of people's anti-fossil fuel thinking is because knowingly or not, they're not thinking of things in a pro-human way. And if you do think of things in a pro-human way, and you look at all the facts, it's actually fairly obvious that we should be using more fossil fuel. A lot of people will probably respond to <laughs> your book negatively, but I think- I hope, I hope so. They tend to ignore it. So this is one thing where what, what, you, what you think, like when you have, con what people think of controversial views is just, oh, you get attacked all the time, which if you look at my Twitter, that, that does happen now. But in general, I would say people with, if there's a true controversial view, the establishment with the wrong view, they tend to not pick on the best version of the controversial view. They tend to pick on the worst. So it'd be like, if some politician who doesn't know much says something ignorant about climate, like they'll jump on that. Mm -hmm. But if I give a really coherent argument about, yes, we do impact climate, I do believe we're gonna have a warming influence in the future that has some positives, some negatives, but whatever that is is far outweighed by the benefits of fossil fuels, like most climate catastrophists don't want to engage that argument by me, right. by others who make similar arguments like Michael Schellenberger or Bjorn mm -hmm. Lomborg or Steve Coonan. What they want to do is they're like, oh, you're a climate change denier. They want to either straw misrepresent the argument, straw man mm -hmm. the argument, or ignore the argument. And one thing that's heartening to me is the more of us that are making these humanistic arguments for fossil fuels, or at least against climate catastrophism, 
the harder it is to ignore. But I, it's still really interesting. Nobody is really engaging us on our arguments, which I think is a good sign for their pro So I look forward to as much attack as I can, <laughs> as I can get, because it's going, the more that happens, the more people will actually see what I think. I think there is changing opinion though. I think people recognize that if you go carbon free for your energy consumption uses, it's gonna trickle down to daily products, day-to-day -day functions, convenient products that have made our lives a lot easier and simpler. So I think people see the connection that if you sacrifice cheap fuel for your energy use, it's gonna come back to you in other aspects of your life. And that's gonna make costs higher and make your less far or make your life less convenient and easy. So maybe people are coming around kind of just seeing overreach in other aspects of American we're policy. Seeing we're seeing it right now. Like, I think it's a really important moment because we're seeing it in Europe happening. And now we're seeing right. it in the US with oil prices, gasoline prices, and mm -hmm. fuel prices in the winter. And I do think it's, it's a crucial moment in two ways. So one is that it's a crucial teaching moment to really lay the blame for these problems in the right place. Which is, really, which is really policies that restrict fossil fuels. So that's the core thing. I mean, people are, fossil fuels are becoming expensive. Why? Is it because the market cannot supply them in response to demand? No, absolutely not. It's because the ability to supply has been restricted by the government, which is mm -hmm. by many governments, which oppose both the production and the transportation of fossil fuels in a lot of different ways. And so if that can become clear, that it's these anti-fossil fuel policies that are restricting fossil fuels and that falsely promised that solar and wind could replace them, which is obviously not happening. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this, this unmet demand for fossil fuels. Like if we can get that across, it's crucial. And particularly because in the US right now, we're talking on December 3rd, like we're talking about this, you know, build back better. I hate that name, like which I call mm -hmm. make everything worse because it is just, it is really saying like, not only are we gonna print a lot of mon new money in a time of inflation and, and pay a bunch more people not to work where we have labor crisis, but in my field, Right, we are going to even more dramatically restrict fossil fuel energy and even more subsidize and mandate unreliable solar and wind. And like we're talking, and, and it's we are really depending on like one or two politicians to stop this thing. It's I don't consider myself particularly political, but it's tragic to me that only one Democrat opposed uh, Build Back Better. Like this is one of the worst pieces of legislation, most anti freedom, certainly most anti energy pieces of legislation. And a huge portion of our politicians are just gung ho. And so the more we can educate the public that, hey, you don't like what's happening now, and this policy is making everything worse, that is really important because there are going to be some countries that totally ruin themselves with bad energy policy, and then others will learn from them. And I want one of I want us to be one of the countries that learn from the bad countries. I don't want us to be the, I don't want us to be like the Venezuela of energy. Heaven forbid that would happen. We don't want to embrace any tenet of collectivism that they have because they were once a prosperous country. Yeah. And now they're in the kind of bottom rungs of, of uh, prosperity, of course. Uh, I have a lot of friends from Venezuela, so they tell me directly what had happened in their country. And it's really a horrible case study. We don't want to emulate them by any means. But it needs to be publicized. So one of the right. tragedies of Venezuela is the media's total non-interest in it. I mean, it is, it is an important story. It's obviously fascinating that you can have a relatively prosperous place where then it's like, you know, people like lose 24 pounds involuntarily. At one point it was the average weight loss. Like the, it's, you know, system, oh, system shut down, chaos, that kind of thing. It's like, that should be a wake up call. That prosperity is not guaranteed. It depends on having the right policies and philosophies. And if you don't have those, you can actually regress. And paradoxically, like many of the so-called progressives, I don't like that term, are leading America to regress, and, and particularly in the realm of energy, which is what I'm focused on. Where could everyone follow your musings, get your books, <laughs> musings, connect with you on social media, drop all the links. Uh, okay, so I'd say the number one would be energytalkingpoints.com. And I highly encourage you to sign up for the free newsletter, which is a Substack newsletter, and then you'll, you'll get those a couple times a week. Uh, I'm on Twitter a lot, so hopefully you follow me on Twitter. Very grateful to you, by the way, for uh, you share a lot of my stuff on Twitter. I was grateful for that. Uh, and then I think if anyone wants to email me directly, it's alex at alexepstein.com. I don't always respond, but I always read it. So alex at alexepstein.com. And I think that's enough for people to remember. Wonderful. Alex, thank you so much for lending your perspective. I think people will be less afraid to make the moral case for fossil fuels. Like I said, I've seen a shift where people were very timid 
But I think seeing people like you who can articulate the need for fossil fuels, even in this day and age with everyone trying to push to go carbon free and zero emissions in it in totality. So I think your perspective is really important, much like Dr. Schellenberger and some of the other individuals you listed. He's not, oh, he's not a doctor. He'll kill you for saying that. I know, I know, I know. I interviewed <laughs> him before. He's like, no, just call me Michael. Call me. Well, no, he's, yeah, because he's not a, he's not any kind of doctor. He's just, a, he's just like me. It's just a, somebody who actually studied the issues and thought right. about them, which to us is sufficient. And some people are like, oh, you don't have a degree. You don't have a climate science degree. And my view is like, well, actually like at most climate science is one piece of the picture. What we really need are people who into, who look at the facts from all fields and integrate them. So that's one mm -hmm. reason I'm a big fan of Mike's work, but I know he, his handle is Schellenberger MD yes. and he hates it because people say, oh, you're pretending to be a doctor. It's like, no, I'm not, but I can't change it now. <laughs> Cause then all, all these old tweets will be lost. <laughs> it's a tough, no, tough he's great. Flight. Yeah, I, I interviewed him about a year ago and he he really is a fascinating person and that's someone that people are looking to for guidance on these issues. And I know he's a big nuclear advocate, so it, it's good to see people like him make the case for nuclear in that semblance. So Alex, thank you so much for speaking with me for both the podcast and the simultaneous YouTube video. Really appreciate it. I will continue to share your work and I, I encourage everyone to connect with you and follow you and we'll include all the related mentioned links into the show notes and bottom notes and comments and everywhere where applicable. Awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you.